Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, I, want, I want to begin by a confession, saying that a few months ago, I did not know what Gen Z meant. <laughs> <laughs> Until this happened, I don't know how to go about here. So I, I, it's something that uh, is developing and it's keep change, it keeps changing every time in, our, in this context. So it's, it's what I'm presenting here is kind of my, my initial uh, thoughts about this. And I keep, I keep, I keep deepening what and learning more about about these Gen Zs. <laughs> I, I learned that I'm a millennial and they're, and they're, they're Gen Zs. Okay. So, moments of crisis can help communities recalibrate and move forward with a new vision and a new hope. Such crisis moments may signal a, the beginning of a new Kairos. A time of God's liberating power entering the human experience. Since its independence in 1963, Kenya has come to the brink of a collapse on many occasions and has succeeded in various ways to move away from the precipice and to chart a new way forward. The gener Generation Z protests that rocked Kenyans in June and July of 2024 constituted another precipice moment. Uh, we, even many people thought that the country will, will really sink. <laughs> the Gen Z are generally uh, considered as a demographic uh, cohort born between 1996 and 2010. I, there are many, many people who have very different ways of, 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 of uh, looking at the Gen Z. Uh, I used the definition by Elizabeth uh, Gorunova and uh, Daniel Jenkins who generally describe the Gen Z as the most ethnically diverse, connected, and technologically sophisticated generation. They enter the global workforce and affect its, dynamic, its dynamics in a profound way. They further note that the Gen Z are more realistic, career-minded, entrepreneurial than the previous generations. They are globally and environmentally aware, concerned about social justice, and want their ideas to be heard and valued. They, these educated young uh, digital natives rely on technology to access and share information and increase their efficiency. The 2024 Gen Z protests in Kenya were unprecedented in the history of the country because they were not organized by any political party or along ethnic lines as has been in the norm in Kenya. It was largely a result of, as a result of online mobilizations of these na digital natives. The new form of digital mobilizations, mobilization and creative imagination uh, invites the church leaders and, politi and politicians to come together and dialogue with this new crop of emerging Gen Z leaders in Kenya for ref the reformation and the imagination of politics and theology. Kenya is a religiously di uh, diverse country. Uh, according to the 2019 census, the population is 85% uh, Christian, 11% Muslim, less than 2% Hindu, Sikh, and ba Baha'i, and practitioner practitioners of African traditional religions. Uh, in this paper, I will uh, focus on Christian churches. I follow J.N.K. J Mugambi's description of Kenyan Christianity as consisting of uh, Roman Catholic Church, Protestants, mainstream Protestants, Pentecostal, and African uh, independent churches. The paper is divided into three parts. The first part, I will focus on the background of the Kenya Gen Z's uh, taxation protest. The second part it will be Kenya's uh, Gen Z uh, in public, public law role. What public, public law are, are they playing? And the third part will be, I will propose a renewed political theology for Kenya. The root cause of the explosive Gen Z uh, protest in Kenya was the heavy taxation burden that Kenya has have experienced in the past few years. Kenya's tax crisis is embedded in the country's long history of national debt, corruption, negative ethnicity in the form of tribalism, youth unemployment, neopatrimonialism, neo a social arrangement in which patrons use state resources to secure loyalty of clients in the general populations. In the general population, these social problems have plagued the nation since uh, uh, its independence in 1963. The tax justice is one of the fundamental issues that 
has been overlooked in Kenya. The problem reached is it's a, a, a point of raw return in June 2024 when the Gen Z decided to take up, to step up and voice their displeasure with the country's taxation and demand accountability. The violent uh, tax protests uh, led by the Gen Zs were catalyzed by the hotly contested and divisive 2022 election cycle. Which politicians, in which politicians promised to bring uh, Kenya's problem to an end, the new administration that came to power, known as the Kenya Kwanza, Kenya First, <laughs> you can, you can, you can uh, understand where that's coming from. The only thing that they, say, they did not say, they did not say they want to make Kenya great again. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> so, but they say Kenya First. <laughs> Kenya first. <laughs> so the, the, the new administration that came to power in uh, September 2022 campaigned on a superb and compelling bottom-up economic transformation agenda. Uh, they promised an eco economic dispensation that would take care of common citizens who struggle to live from hand to mouth, and they called them hustlers. And I think their, 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 their motto was, every hustle matters. The voice of these ordinary masses, the hustlers, uh, matter to this polit the, the political class during election cycles, but after the voting process, the political class forgets them until the next uh, election. However, two years, in the two years that the regime was in, has been in power, there has been a growing resentment uh, because of the high taxes the government has imposed on the people. Uh, the tax hikes of 2023 uh, included a, a 2.5 uh, basic uh, housing levy on the basic salary of all salaried employees. Uh, this was resented by many people who think that housing should be left to the private sector because the previous government housing projects generally failed because of corruption and mismanagement. In the 2024 finance bill, things were even worse. Uh, the taxes were going to increase for, by 11.9%, and the, the, this taxation regime uh, uh, targeted uh, services like uh, mobile money transfer. They wanted to increase also a uh, tax on uh, bread, 16% tax, uh, an echo levy on sanitary pads and diapers, an annual motor vehicle tax. So if you own a car, you have to pay a tax for that car. <laughs> so it's, it was quite, it was quite outrageous. So part of this, the reason is uh, for those, that high taxation regime was to pay loans to pay uh, the loans on to uh, this uh, external and, and internal uh, 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 loans that uh, the country owns to the IMF, World Bank, and other, other lending organizations. Uh, by the end of the 2024, uh, it is estimated that Kenya's uh, uh, public debt to GDP ratio will have reached 70.2%. So, it's it's quite it's quite something. It's quite it was quite a heavy burden that 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 brought brought up this. Part of the problem is that the loans from these lending organizations never benefited the people because corrupt government officials looted the huge amount a huge amount of it, and that uh, and that partly uh, angered ordinary people, and that's why the 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 Gen Zs decided to to come up and 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 and, and, and uh, protest this. Why should citizens who struggle to, to pay, who struggle to live, pay back money that has been, uh, that has not benefited them? Another source of uh, uh, inequality in Kenya is land. Also, this is, a, this is just a, a, a comic way of looking at it. Uh, so the former president received a, a, a loan from the, uh, of, of a, bad, a, 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 low, a debt of 1.7 trillion, but he left 8.7 trillion, 386% rise. The current one, after just one year, had already borrowed, uh, had already borrowed 21% of what he had already, uh, of, the, of the debt that he had already, had already inherited. So there had to be a, a stop of this. And I think there is a, there is a, the, 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 this is a very, very 
says it very well. So he needed to be taken to a long addiction rehabilitation <laughs> center. <laughs> so uh, Kenya is number eight in lending in the, in, in the money that we have taken from the IMF. Argentina is the leading. So another problem that is in Kenya is uh, uh, that causes inequality and, uh, and poverty is land grabbing, land accumulation. Land accumulation by the rich at the expense of the poor masses is common in a phenomenon in Kenya. Uh, in social science uh, literature, this process is known as latifundialization, which is generally defined as a process of land accumulation by a few wealthy landowners leaving the ordinary peasants poorer. The inequality that is based on illegal accusation of land has been a, a perennial issue in Kenya that needs to be urgently addressed. Agriculture is the backbone of the country uh, and the country's economy, and the need of land is great in Kenya. Eight million small uh, holder farmers who account for 80% of the country's agricultural output struggle to survive on small pieces of land, yet very few political in the political class have amassed a lot of land. And the president has led, in the, in the 25 years he has been in politics, he has really accumulated a lot of land. And the former president too, from his father, the founding father of Kenya, they accumulated a lot, a lot, a lot of land. So the Gen Z is uh, seven days of rage. Uh, what is, uh, as, is a special characteristic of the Gen Z in Kenya? In a country in which tribalism and uh, political connections based on your patrimonialism determine uh, your chance and level of success, the Kenyan Gen Zs have demonstrated that these vices can be transcended. The, the Gen Z uh, revolution witnessed in the tax demonstration throughout Kenya may signal the beginning of an end of tribal new patrimonial politics and a new dispensation. The healthy nationalism that united people in Kenya in 1963 disintegrated over the years into tribalism. The patronage uh, uh, system that is uh, centered on the presidency has perpetuated a politics of exclusion that has enhanced negative ethnicity. The tribe of the sitting president is always favored Success in the public sector in Kenya always depends on the tribe that one belongs and who you know in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the government. The Gen Z are charting a new, path, new identity and a new path that views being Kenyan as more important than being rather than just being a member of a tribe. So they had their seven days of rage. Uh, which uh, brought some concrete results. The president had to withdraw the bill, the finance bill, and the, 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 the president had to fire the entire cabinet and reconstitute it, and also brought about new austerity measures, including disbanding 47 unprofitable state-owned companies. The protest also led to the resignation of the inspector of the police because of police brutality and the abductions of, of protesters. So those, those are some of the things that, uh, that the Gen Z uh, uh, achieved. And uh, some comic relief there. <laughs> so that's, that's who, what uh, comics uh, came up with. Uh, the African uh, Youth Survey published in, uh, in, uh, in August uh, from the Johannesburg based Ichikovi's Family Foundation surveyed 5,600. 604, sorry, that was a typo there. Yeah. 5,604 Gen Zs between 18 and 24 years of years in 18 sub Saharan countries, including Kenya. They reported that 83% of these Gen Zs are concerned about corruption, and 62% and and believe that their government are failing to, to, to address it. And so this problem is not only a Kenyan problem, but it, it, it's widespread across other countries. And that's why Nigeria, Ghana, Zimbabwe, and Uganda organize the Gen Zs, they organize this. Theological reflection towards a renewed uh, Kenyan political theology. This is very tentative, and uh, uh, you, will, you, will, you will have to support me to, to make it better. JNK Mugambi, following John Baptist, may define political theology as a theology that resists the Seattle amnesia, and instead emphasizes the active, critical, and transformative remembrance of suffering of the oppressed. Such a theology is urgently needed in Kenyan context. 
in which Christianity has been politically weaponized to promote a societal amnesia that promotes injustice. So that is how Christianity has been weaponized in Kenya. That is the president wearing uh, as a pastor. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, 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 the political class and the, and the, and the, and the, and the church leaders are really complicit. They just, in Kenya, church liturgies and church-related events are freely used as platforms for political campaigns and open politicking sometimes uh, accompanied by destructive, insightful, and malicious rhetoric is perpetuated. And he, yeah, they, they will pray and even read from the Bible, but after that, they will start inciting one another and everything. And then, uh, after that, uh, usually, uh, is a way of gathering uh, political support. And at the end of these visits, the politicians usually give the, give the, polit uh, the church leaders a lot of money. A lot of money is given there, and uh, some of, sometimes, and it's in cash. And sometimes with this money, we don't know where this money is coming from. The church leaders receive this, even Catholics, or across the board, Protestants and everything, they receive this money for, for, for that. So across the, uh, the board, uh, churches have an insatiable appetite for money from politicians. Such church leaders do not uh, care where the money comes from. The tendency of church leaders to receive hefty amount of money from government officials for different church purposes is common in Kenya. Uh, politicians have overwhelmingly misused uh, church fundraising uh, activities, also popularly known as harambes in Kenya, uh, which is, means pulling together, to gain political mileage, uh, and, uh, and sometimes these are coming from the process of corruption. The Gen Z's uh, operation uh, Occupy churches and operation clean the altar, which aimed at uh, preventing politicians from speaking in churches, sent a strong message to church leaders to desist from being complicit in political manipulation and corruption. In this way, the Gen Z is shaping a new relationship between the church and politics in Kenya. The Gen Z have also raised a lack of accountability uh, and transparency in churches. If the Kenyan society is, is, is to be free from corruption, the church leaders need to be the ones leading as the conscience for the society by fostering transparency within the churches. The church has also increasingly failed to address the social justice issues because of the loss of its moral authority through being complicit with the political class. I have that him there again. <laughs> and then this... Uh, it's a, the, the common belief in Kenya that the only well, uh, the, the language that the leaders know very well is this one: silence and hypocrisy. So this uh, is uh, the Archbishop of, uh, who is now the current Archbishop of Nairobi, receiving a car from the president. But there was a lot of uh, backlash on this, and he had to give away that car. <laughs> <laughs> he had to give away that car. So, uh, so there's a lack of social, no, social justice is, is, is non-existing. The impact of the church in promotion of social justice falls short of what is expected by the public. For example, in uh, the Kenya Catholic Bishops Conference, KCCB, response to the 2024 taxation protest was to issue pastoral statements that had no tangible impact. The contents of the pastoral statements were devoid of theological reflection and the actionable pastoral plans that could help address the tax justice issues raised by the Gen Z. These statements made no mention of Catholic social teachings on economic justice. Other churches also issued inconsequential statements under the umbrella body, National Council Churches of Kenya, NCCK. Both the KCCB and the NCCK's pastoral statements on the Gen Z protests were consequently not taken seriously most Kenyans viewed them as mere commentaries on the situation. There is no action, really, that the church is, is doing in Kenya because of this publicity and the hypocrisy that is, is widely known in the Kenyan public. So let me conclude. Um, and then I think the rest will come as in form of questions. The 2024, uh, 2024, 2025 financial bill revealed uh, governance issues in Kenya that has been ignored for a long time. Church leaders whose prophetic duty is to hold government accountable seem to have failed in that duty. 
Many church leaders have been uh, compromised because they have benefited financially from the polit political class. The Gen Zs have come out strongly to condemn this unholy alliance in the strongest terms, pos terms possible. What Kenya has witnessed in the protests that erupted in the aftermath of the 2024-2025 financial bill is unprecedented. I have argued that uh, the Gen Z protests have ushered in a new political and theological dispensation for Kenya. Their prophetic action can push for a pragmatic political theology for Kenya that can guide a proper relationship between church and state. Thank you. Sorry, I overprepared. <laughs> and and that, that is just a quarter of what I had. <laughs> yeah. Hey, folks, you heard it here first. Make Kenya great again. Yes, for the Yeah, and thank you very much. I really enjoyed your paper. Yeah. Um, thank you for Gado's uh, cartoon. Yeah. I follow him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is something that. Um, I think uh, Cyril here has discussed this in his book on uh, in the African Post, and the recent book of uh, uh, David Ngong on uh, Senghor's Eucharist, uh, political theology for Africa, is the <laughs> simple question, but very disconcerting, that all, maybe someone will correct me, all the political protests that have taken place in Africa have not been inspired by any Christian narrative. Even in my home country, Nigeria, the guy who people followed in the last uh, presidential election, Peter B, was not being followed because of his Catholicism or Christian credentials. The Arab Spring in, that started in Tunisia, now Tunisia is preparing for another election that is only God knows was not inspired by Muslim ideals. So this is not just about Christianity. The Gen Zs were not carrying their Bible or carrying their crosses. But if you look at Latin America, the theology of the people that gave birth to movements in Argentina like Peronism, you know, even though people now may disavow of Peronism later, but Pope Francis is the product of the theology of the people. If not in Latin America, their priests, their bishops go with them protest and we know many of the martyrs. So that's really something, uh, if you're talking about the political theology that is growing out from this, I don't think that the Gen Z's will, might agree that uh, since already we see our, we see the political theology that uh, the church is giving is the politics of the stomach. <laughs> so it's just, it's just uh, uh, is a, is a, I mean, if you look at Senegal, the same thing, the, what happened in Senegal, it wasn't because of Muslim ideals or Christian ideals that we have a new dispensation there against uh, this guy that wanted to stay put. So why is it that our Christian or Islamic religious traditions have not embodied the prophetic tradition that could reinforce, support, or trigger this kind of subversive counter movements in the continent. Yeah, I I really would not have <laughs> an answer to that. But I think I think maybe the what I can say is this uh, Gen Z uh, protests have really re reawakened and and, and uh, really challenged the church in Africa to really think about its prophetic mission. So what 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 can the church do? What can the church uh, uh, what can the church do to, to really be a voice of the voiceless? Uh, because of this uh, slumber that we, we see, like him, the uh, Archbishop of Nairobi, <coughs> gave a homily on the Gen Z protest, but there was really nothing action. Of course, some other churches tried to take their Gen Zs to the streets, they tried it, but it did not have any impact. So it's really something that uh, it has sparked. Uh, reflection and, and, and thinking about what to do in, in this issue of uh, justice, economic justice, tax justice. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Osman. I think I know this paper. Um, when what was just going on, giving you paper also, I think uh, 
what really came to my mind was uh, Thomas Sankara's uh, view of uh, using madness as a trajectory for reinventing a new future. Uh, I think uh, I see the Gen Zs, I think, uh, showing us uh, the best way we can make our society better, especially in the African context. Um, again, also, I think what comes to my mind is uh, Katongola's uh, view, it is a sacrifice of Africa. It's a kind of vindicating what he said there by him. Saying that uh, uh, the more the church grow, especially in Africa, the more they get themselves uh, disconnected from the social political reality. Yeah. Uh, now, you have really uh, given us the example. Uh, this Gen Z for me is kind of uh, setting a template for us. But at the same time, uh, we are working our consciousness of what is going wrong in our society, especially in African context. So, uh, and uh, you have showed us, uh, even from these cartoons, what the, the way the church, even not only in Kenya, across, Afri across Africa, uh, what do you think uh, from this your paper? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what do you think uh, uh, the church, uh, do you think the church uh, has learned anything from what the Gen Z okay. has done? And uh, do you think they are really uh, yeah. trying to learn anything at all? So, this is my impression from the Kenyan experience and following what is going on on the ground. I think the church has not yet learned. So I think it's a role for of theologians to, to, to really push for this and maybe to, 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 to really talk to these people. Like if you read their pastoral letters and pastoral sentences, there is no theological, deep theological reflection. There is no pastoral plans. There is no, really, if I wanted to show the, the letter, the, the statement they gave, you can laugh. <laughs> it's like, there is no action, no action. So I, I, I doubt if they have, they have like, So there is a long way. I think there is one more. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, I love to hear your talk, and I want you to just make a comment and see a reaction because it's just very connected to what Stan said. And I came from Latin America, uh, and I grew up in a in a in in a context like, for example, with the church was very prophetic. And my own activism as a young man in Brazil was for health reform from the church. We have a pastoral health care in Brazil that we align with the movements of uh, reform, like health reform, and then we build. We turn the dictatorship peacefully and we build a public health care system that's universal coverage today. It's far from ideal, but it's great compared to what you used to have and it's accessible for everyone. And I feel very proud of that. And the church was very engaged and still, like in Brazil today, um, even the church is leaning more towards like a more conservative side, but don't have any skin of corruption with the politics. They don't align. They still have a, you'd say a prophetic voice, but in a different agenda, less social justice, more like moral and customs, but still prophetic in that sense. And then very, I was very shocked to hear from Africa, uh, you and then said you don't have that in it. My last thing in here, and my reading of the reality in Brazil, that was possible only because the work of base Brazil communities, small communities, that we are doing there, and the bishop, you know, and the, the, the priest who are there in those communities as an equal, not, not like a, a, a authority. The authority was liturgical during the Mass, but the, the community was led by lay people. And then all the movements start from that, but is not as same today, but start. And then I would say, is there any movement, or you see at the Gen Z, any movement from the ground like that has small liturgical religious experience in the, sense, in the church of support or the prophetic voice can actually raise from there instead yeah. of just wait from a top down waiting for the bishop to say, yeah, let's be prophetic. Yeah, I, I have this in my paper, but I, I didn't get to it. I think one of the things that I see as an opportunity is maybe the church to uh, uh, re, uh, re use uh, the internet and social media and for re evangelization. For that to, to, to get in touch with these Gen Z's at that level. Because small Christian communities are there in Kenya.
But uh, these days, people are more online. And especially when to reach these Gen Zs and, and continue to evangelize them and to talk about social justice with them and to talk about tax justice with them. You have to do it online. You have to do it in the, in the, in the, in the digital uh, platforms. And I think that's for me, is an opportunity there. Small Christian communities have no much impact. Okay. What the last, we are out of time, but I'll give um, Omeka we'll the last question, please, and quickly. Oh, okay. Thank you. I don't even know if it's a question. Um, I think first thing I want to identify with uh, the reality of uh, the absence of the church in any social revolution that changes Africa. And the other thing is also to attempt not to answer the question, um, what do you think the church has learned? You know, I, I think it's a presumption that we think that the church listens and learns. <laughs> yeah. should, I mean, a, a theologian or professor once said to us that we make the mistake to think that bishops read. They don't read. <laughs> and so if you, if you do everything you do as academics and bring forward, think you can inspire their work, that is not where they are going. So I also subscribe to the fact of uh, what I think propels revolution and may change African narrative is leaderless revolution, which is what you see in the act of Gen Z and others. So when we are taking for, uh, when we are waiting for any constituted authority to lead or to inspire or to protect or guide, it will not work. Um, the, a, a, a former uh, British uh, uh, diplomat at the UN once said that uh, his name is uh, uh, Ross Kern. He said the only way Arab Springs it was initiated and was sustained because there was no leader. Uh -huh. The answers in Nigeria survived for the long time it survived because they were unable to identify leaders. But the Enbad government could not go far because some leaders were appointed out. And the church was an instrument to make it not work because you were asked to make sure to, you, you put on the front burner the, the, the consequences of this in terms of negative impact. And so few opportunity that the church had to maximize that for upturn was also used for the downturn to make the people not come to the street to do so. So I identify with a new narrative and a new method of changing the African space. I think the only thing the church might learn is to know that it will also be a victim when the revolution starts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give our presenter another hand. Thank you very much. So we have we have break now till.